Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Erwin Lin. I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Architecture. Specifically, I teach uh, landscape architecture. And so today is a very quick um, talk to talk about what landscape architecture is and give you a brief idea about um, how we go about teaching landscape architecture in the US. Now, landscape architecture in the US has been around for 10 years. Uh, but it's the first time that we are doing a bachelor's program. So this year, we're having a, a bachelor's program for the first time. Uh, the past 10 years, we've been running a master's program. Uh, in fact, I am a graduate of that program as well. And today, we really want to explain to you how landscape architecture um, is being taught in the US and what exactly is landscape architecture, because I think that's something that uh, people get a little bit confused about. Now, uh, to put it simply, we are a profession that connects nature, people, and place. Now, uh, as landscape architects, unlike uh, some of our peers, like the architects, uh, we definitely use nature as our canvas. So we talk about topography, we talk about water flows, ecology, vegetation, um, we talk about uh, things like uh, urban farming even. So, aspects of nature, but we are not uh, coming from the botanical sciences department. So we are definitely still a design discipline and in order to, to be a design discipline, we are also a spatial discipline. So we talk about place and of course how uh, people connect to the place and, and subsequently how it connects to nature. Now, uh, just to give you an understanding about the discipline itself, uh, it is an increasingly popular and in-demand profession. So landscape architects are actually in, in worldwide, there's a shortage of them. Uh, and it's becoming clear that they are kind of uh, the, the latest generation of thinkers and, and designers that will propel us towards uh, what is known as the ecological age. Right. So the ecological age is something where, which some, um, some scholars are, are saying that we are currently entering or are already in. Uh, so we had the tribal age, the age of great civilizations, the technological age, and we are entering or have already entered what is known as the ecological age. And it is certain that landscape architecture will be one of the core disciplines in this ecological age. And it's fantastic to have this new program to then uh, train the next generation as well. Now, landscape architecture, like I mentioned, is definitely still a design discipline uh, at its core, but there's so much more to, to landscape architecture than, than meets the eye. There are many, many layers. Uh, so there's um, geography, there's anthropology, there's horticulture, there's architecture, of course, uh, art, history, social sciences, and so on and so forth. And the landscape architect's role in all of this is to, to you serve as maybe kind of a middleman or a conduit um, for all these different disciplines to come together to create better places, more imaginable places uh, that spark the imagination, that spark um, uh, issues of biophilia, uh, of ecology and, and of sustainability in our global environment. Now, like I said, we have gone through 10 years in uh, the master's program and I wanted to run you through some of the studios that we have done and some of the overarching uh, themes that we usually talk about in the studio. So one of the first is deforestation management. Now, uh, the scene that you see on the screen, this is something quite common in, uh, in many countries around the world, not just Singapore. Uh, the forest or secondary forest in this case generally is cleared before any development happens. Now, us as landscape architects are coming in and saying, hey, look, wait, why don't we do this a little bit different, right? Why don't we take stock of what is there first? Why don't we leverage off whatever is there before we clear the land and then start from scratch? So why don't we take stock of the vegetation that's there, the forest that is there, and leverage off the forest that's already there to create a better environment for it? Now, um, we also talk about rivers, we talk about interfaces between water and Land. So on the background is actually a project in which they looked at uh, a national park, uh, specifically a marine reserve. 
and how exactly can landscape architects um, not only talk about land, of course, but also talk about water and how water interfaces uh, with the landscape itself. Uh, the bottom right image you see uh, one of our students at Sungai Pandan. So again, this idea whereby mangroves are essentially also a kind of landscape that we can work on and how we can leverage off this interface between water and land, uh, again, for the betterment of our built environment. Now, being in Singapore, one of the, the interesting things is that because we are in the equator, the potential for us to grow vegetation is immense. Um, unlike some of our, 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 our other cities in more uh, colder climates. Now, uh, so one of the other themes has always been rewilding Singapore, where it's a dream such that perhaps we can actually slowly and incrementally bring back the forest, bring back the secondary forest and maybe even the primary forest into our backyards all across Singapore. And quite honestly, this is quite a, a real true possibility um, simply because we are literally in the tropics. It's just a matter of whether we want to and how to do it, actually do it. Uh, another very important topic that revolves uh, contemporary landscape architecture is the idea that landscape can be part of infrastructure. So in the image that you see, in this case, uh, why not think of uh, the cycling infrastructure, traffic infrastructure, uh, as a kind of landscape by itself. After all, it is interconnected with uh, pathways, with parks, with greenery, with the outdoors, and this is really our domain. But it doesn't stop just there, it doesn't stop with just traffic. Why not look at water infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, the power lines, whether you look at sewage, whether you look at um, all these other uh, generally thought of as engineering approaches, why can't we combine ecological thinking uh, and landscape design into these projects, these infrastructure projects? Another topic that we like to talk about is uh, neighborhood landscapes. So in Singapore, we have a very uh, successful public housing project. Um, that has been ongoing since our independence. Um, but what has been left over, at least in between the buildings, in between the public housing, has been areas whereby uh, they are green, but they don't necessarily instill much um, imagination in the residents. So neighborhood landscape is something that we want to reimagine if we have the chance to go in and redevelop some of these green spaces in between the buildings. How can we bring about more energy, more, more vitality into these spaces through design? Uh, productive landscapes is something that we, we generally talk about as well. Uh, in fact, historically, it is one of the first, uh, first instances in which humans actually started working on land itself. Basically, we started with agriculture, right? Back in, uh, back in where we started when the first civilization first started. So in the image that you see, it was a special semester. We brought students to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, to help set up a edible schoolyard. And it is something that is currently, at least in a lot of urban centers in the world, um, uh, almost like a movement in which uh, urbanized people who are living in the city yourself and yourself suddenly want to farm for some reason. I don't believe it is truly to fill our bellies. I think, again, it is that connection back to nature that we are trying to foster. Uh, and increasingly, we find that landscape architecture uh, professionals are asked to work on much larger scale projects. Uh, and it's even my own personal hope that many of our graduates will go and work at these large scale projects. Why these large scale projects and why, why this, this kind of uh, landscape planning and regional planning instead of just smaller projects? I think if you want to really create the next generation of cities which are truly ecological, truly sustainable, then it has to start with the existing landscape. So that's where landscape architects come in. They look at the existing, like I mentioned, and then decide what should be reserved, where should development happen, uh, how best to connect whatever uh, fragments of natural landscape that we have uh, in the city before destroying it and then losing it forever. So again, it is not just about the, the fantastic tiny projects that you see in Singapore, like Gardens by the Bay or uh, the Jewel at Changi Airport, but it's really about uh, moving towards a much larger scale and looking at 
the building of new city as well. Now, of course, in Singapore, we talk about a lot about high rise greening, uh, sky rise greening uh, is the term that we use, uh, high density in which the, the buildings themselves are extremely tall, extremely closely packed together. But how in Singapore have we managed to achieve uh, so much greening in our campus? If you've ever come to Singapore, you will know that um, we are extremely green. We have a lot of vegetation, not just around our buildings, not just in between our buildings, but on our buildings as well. And of course, a lot of it is down to the technology in which we will, of course, uh, introduce to, to the students. Uh, what exactly is this technology that has brought about the ability for us to uh, literally plant trees on buildings? Now, um, although we talk about cities like Singapore, extremely urban, extremely uh, built up already, a lot of our studios actually travel abroad. So we go to the region, we go to East Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, I just brought my students back from Jakarta as well. And we are looking at places whereby rapid urbanization is happening. And again, we are trying to inculcate in our students, and not just our students, but uh, the people that we meet, that we should stop and look at the landscape first. We should look at topography first, look at water first, look at the natural systems that are already in place, that have been there for centuries before we came about, and try to leverage off them. We are not anti-development, that's, that's pretty clear. In fact, I think the profession cannot exist without actual development itself, but we can do it in a more sustainable way, a more ecological, maybe even economical way as well. Uh, and it's just a matter of changing the way and the mode of operation in which we go in and uh, urbanize our own environment. Now, uh, the one of the last things that we talk about is, um, so landscape in Singapore are almost like a luxury. They are in certain cases taken for granted. But in many places around the world, landscapes are actually a necessity. They basically provide food, they provide shelter, uh, they provide water, they clean the land, uh, they provide livelihood for the villages around them. So in this graphic, um, it was in Manila, in the Philippines. And how landscapes, if designed well, can actually bring about these kind of social betterments for, for uh, communities which are um, not as well off as many those that we find in some of the cities. Right. Uh, and it's really something that we truly believe in, in that it doesn't necessarily have to be the picture perfect part. A lot of landscape can actually come in at a very, very ground level uh, and benefit people directly. Now, just to round off, again, like I mentioned, we are starting our new bachelor's uh, of landscape architecture program here at NUS. Um, and we are really trying to train the next generation of landscape architects, both in practice and academia. And we want them to be stewards. Uh, we want them to take charge of our environment and then shape it into something that's more livable, more resilient, more sustainable, um, and really push that idea of greening uh, of our cities forward. Now, the program structure is quite straightforward. If you are coming in from a A-level or a otherwise a similar kind of high school level, you will come in with the rest of your undergrads and year one. If you had a prior diploma relating to landscape architecture, not necessarily landscape architecture, uh, there is a potential that you can be slotted in at year two we said, so meaning to say that you skip the entire first year. Uh, there will be some modules that you will still need to take, uh, but you can skip an entire year. And then it goes on to four years of the bachelor's program, which results in a bachelor's of landscape architecture. Uh, if you choose to, you could go on to an additional year to do your master's and then get a master's program as well. Uh, but either way, both of these can lead to accreditation. So we, I already have an understanding with the Singapore Institute of Landscape Architects that after you graduate, regardless if it's a bachelor's or a master's, you can work two or three years and then you're eligible to sit for the accreditation. So that brings me to the end of my uh, brief introduction of landscape architecture, specifically our program. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can visit us at our website. The website will give you things like the administrative matters uh, and then some of our background information. 
but they wanted to really look at how the students uh, interact, or how the studios are conducted, some of the behind the scenes uh, uh, photographs and maybe even videos. You can visit our Facebook page uh, as well as our Instagram. Um, we try to give a sense of what uh, landscape architecture is. And this is really not about um, uh, the classrooms most of the time. It's definitely a very outdoor based um, uh, discipline and program. And yeah, so I look forward to seeing all of you at NUS. Uh, our admissions are open, so please go to our website. And if you're interested, I hope you're interested, um, try and apply. And I hope to see you in.